Let's bless the Lord together. Holy, holy Lord, you're worthy. And I'm honored to sing your praise. King of glory. Yes. 
times of refreshing are in your presence, Lord. We lift up your name, Lord, and we exalt you. Join with us as we bless our Father. call you Abba, Papa, a good father in whom there is no variation. And today, even as we prepare to hear your word, we thank you that your word gives life. Thank you today that your word can make the deer give birth. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth. Even as David wrote in Psalm 29, we believe today that your word as it comes forth, the voice of the Lord will break the cedars of Lebanon. Break pride in us, Father. Uproot all forms of bitterness, unforgiveness. Thank you that faith will arise and we will walk in obedience to your word. We bless you and we celebrate the word of the Lord for this hour and season. Now, Lord, let grace and strength be imparted to all who hear. Thank you that faith comes by hearing. And as we hear the word of God, thank you today that our faith levels arise. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, again, friends, it's a joy to be with you on this uh, Sunday morning. We greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we thank God that we could be with you today. Well, it's the last day of summer, and I trust that you and your family are safe. We're almost at a one-year mark of lockdown in South Africa. One year almost since we've gathered. But we thank God that through technology, we could come into your homes and we could share the word of the Lord with you. We know that the church has not shut down or closed. It simply moved or migrated into family units, into the microcosmic entity of family. And I pray that even as we share God's word with you, you together with your family will dialogue the word of God, even over the table, over the common meal, that you'll begin to engage the Holy Scriptures with each other. Let's bow for prayers this morning. Father, we are so thankful that we can hear the word of the Lord. Faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of the Lord. And in a time when so many people have lost their lives and so many people have lost livelihoods, we together as a family could come around the word of the Lord. May your word align us. May it show us the blueprint of heaven and bring us into alignment with the patterned son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, you are our teacher. 
You are our helper and our paracletos. So help us today as we come around the proceeding word of the Lord. May it convict us. May it bring us to the place of compliance with the heavenly standard. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, for the last uh, several weeks in 2021, we have been speaking about laying foundations. Isaiah says, I lay in Zion a sure foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, and that foundation was pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. When uh, Jesus concluded the Sermon on the Mount, he declared in Matthew 7, He who hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. He also spoke of the foolish one who heard and didn't do, and that was building on the sand. But um, last week we began to speak about the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. John on the Isle of Patmos in Revelation 13 declares that the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. And throughout the canon of scripture, Genesis through to Revelation, we find the lamb depicted. And in the finality, in the consummate and concluding book of the Bible, the lamb is seen as one who is on the throne. Jesus, as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the king of kings and the lord of lords, is seen as not just the lamb, but the slain lamb who was in the midst. Now, the lamb is uh, an animal who is selfless. The lamb is seen as an animal that is defenseless, one that is sacrificial in nature, one that displays meekness, humility, one showcasing brokenness, but always living for the benefit of another. The lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. That means in God the Father and in God speaking creation into existence, everything was built upon the slain lamb. The foundation is the slain lamb. And as you begin to live and lay foundations on the earth, it has to be built on Christ the solid rock who is the slain lamb from the foundation of the world. That means everything that was created was meant to be of benefit to another, meant to live sacrificially, even in creation. If you take the simple example of a tree, the tree provides shade, it gives fruit, and in the fruit is seed, but it's all for the benefit of another. If you look at the sun, the moon, and the stars, giving off light, bringing it into its optimal function, functionality, when it is able to give off light, and that is living for the benefit of another. Now, the nature of the land is diametrically opposed to the nature of postmodern people. The way of the world currently is self-promotion. It is self-indulgence. It is self-preservation. And Jesus spoke in Matthew 16, 25, and he says, if you love your life, you will lose your life. But the nature of the lamb is not to draw attention to himself, but to remain hidden. You will know the Lord Jesus for 30 years. He remained hidden under Joseph's roof or care. And then he comes to the river Jordan. And when he comes to the river Jordan, John, although he would have heard the father declare, this is my beloved son, John declares, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Whilst the heavens, the father from the heaven is declaring, this is my beloved son, on the earth, John is seeing the posture of the Lamb. Son seen from the heavens, but Lamb seen on the earth. John introduces Jesus as the Lamb. This Lamb is one who is docile. This is a very interesting word, docile. Because when you have the Lamb nature, you are in the posture of one who is ready to receive instruction and walk in submission to another's will. The lamb who is docile is passive, compliant, willing, obedient, submissive, and pliable. Now this is the foundation of the world. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And if you and I are built on Christ 
the solid rock. We must display this posture of the lamb. It's this posture of the bond servant. Many times in our journey, we understand our sonship. We understand that we are a royal priesthood. That is our position. But we fail in the area of our posture, which is our attitude and our approach, which is meant to be that of the Lamb. When you look at the nation of Israel, the Father describes Israel in the book of Exodus, Israel is my firstborn. Now that's a very privileged position to be in the firstborn position. When he speaks to Pharaoh, he speaks of the nation as his firstborn. But the nation had to go through the wilderness. God would take them, Deuteronomy would record, he would take them 40 years through the wilderness. A journey that was meant to last probably in modern times 40 hours took them 40 years. But he takes them through the wilderness to humble them, to test them and bring them into compliance with the divine demand. And during those 40 years, there were murmurings, there were complaints against Moses, there were complaints against God. And during that period of time, many people died in the wilderness. Jacob had to be squeezed into Israel. In Isaiah 43, Isaiah writes, Jacob I have created, Israel I have formed. You see, Jacob is created to create means to bring into existence but israel is formed to form is to squeeze into shape and many times you go through a wilderness you go through breakings like jacob losing rachel losing joseph coming to the place where to labor for many years in laban's house wages decreased several times squeezings are taking place to adjust our posture So even the nation in the wilderness, in this dry and arid place, this place of no infrastructure, had to come to the place where they could completely lean on the Lord. And what God is doing in this hour and in this period is allowing for us to be squeezed into shape. Isaac, as the promised son in Genesis 22, would ask the question, We have the fire, we have the wood, but where is the lamb? And you would know that Isaac was bound to the altar by his father Abraham. You see, Isaac, as the promised son, had to take the posture of the lamb. And I believe today that that posture is one of great humility. For a father to bind his son onto the altar... Isaac would have been grown up by that time. Different Bible commentators have uh, different age categories that they say Isaac would have been. Most of them agree around the age of 13. But as a grown lad, he knew exactly what was taking place, but he knew how to submit to the will of Father. And this is a great posture of humility. And I submit to us, humility is not something that we can just learn at school but it is attained by men and women under the hand of God. Humility and meekness can, can only be positioned, can only be imparted into a human vessel when they are in close proximity with God. And God is one who is meek and lowly of heart. Isn't it amazing, friends, that the posture of humility, the posture of of meekness brings acceleration it's amazing that when we posture ourselves in humility god accelerates us and brings us to the place of divine purpose now when we read the book of exodus chapter 12 as the children of israel were planning their exit out of egypt you can read in exodus 12 and verse 11 this is what the scriptures record And thus you shall eat it. This is the Passover lamb. You shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. The lamb had to be 
eaten in haste. And I believe today these are all pictures of movement with acceleration. When you look at the Lord Jesus Christ on the earth, he comes to the river Jordan and as he comes to this place which means descender and he begins the work of the ministry, begins to express the nature of the kingdom. He was about his father's business. But in three and a half years, he accelerated his purpose on the earth and concluded the mandate given by the father by declaring it is finished. This is the nature of the lamb to move with speed and acceleration. Same with Abraham when he encountered uh, the visitation of the Lord. He got Sarah to, to move quickly. He moved with haste and acceleration. And we as the sons of God today must find out what is slowing us down. Why aren't we moving with speed and acceleration? The first miracle that the Lord Jesus would, uh, would do in Cana of Galilee at the wedding was the turning of water into wine. And you know that wine takes a long time to mature. But the governor of the feast would say, you have kept the best wine for last. Jesus would fill the jars with water and instantaneously the water will be turned into wine. I believe the first shall be last. That first miracle, which was a miracle of acceleration, will now be seen in the end time church where sons of God will be filled with the water of God's word and the world will taste a superior wine on the earth. But it's going to take a people who have the posture of the Lamb. Jesus engages ministry, but he begins with the miracle of acceleration. Now for today's journey, I want for us to look into our own lives and to discover what are the things that are slowing us down. The lamb, you had to eat it with a certain attire. It was the belt um, on the waist. It was the sandals on your feet. It was the staff in your hand. When you read the New Testament, it was the belt of truth. The um, sandals on your feet would showcase one who walks in peace. But the staff in your hand is a reflection of the word of God. And you can look at the versatility uh, of Moses' staff in his hand. But... All of this reflects a person who is prepared to move at any time. The posture of the lamb, when we are built and when we are postured in the nature of the lamb, this is one who is ready to move at any time when the shepherd requires movement. This is when we are led by the Holy Spirit. This is a heart that is prepared to obey with immediacy. Abraham was ready to leave the Ur of the Chaldeans. Abraham would always declare, here I am, here I am. And in the ultimate moment of his obedience, he heard the voice of God and was ready to offer Isaac his son. And Isaac was one who was able to obey and was without reservation. But this lamb must be eaten in haste and there had to be no delays in eating preparing and leaving and i believe today god as we would go through this period of lockdown is preparing a church to accelerate his divine mandate on the earth this is not a time of of shutdown this period where many feel is a period of ungrowth. I believe today as we in the coming days will return to our households, as we will return to our family units uh, of local church and then begin to construct the city church, we're going to see the word of the Lord grow mightily and prevail. There are moments in our lives where we must act quickly and speedily. The, 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 the Bible says in Exodus 22 and verse 29, this is a very prophetic verse. You shall not delay to offer the first of your ripe produce and juices. The firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. I love what David says in Psalm 119 verse 60. He says, I made haste and did not delay to keep your commands. I made haste and did not delay to keep your commands. 
We are built upon Christ the solid rock, Christ who is the sure foundation, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the earth. And foundationally, we have to go back to this posture of the lamb. But the lamb, remember, had to be eaten in haste. And today I want to be very practical with us, and there will be several practical matters that we will go through. But we must ask ourselves the question, what is delaying us? Domestic problems. This is very, very common in this 21st century. Domestic problems where you have marriage problems consistently, and some of them happen cyclically. That means they will go in six months or a year cycles and come back. Problems between parents and children, children and children. When there are unresolved issues, there's offense, there's unforgiveness. That can slow you down. An unhealthy lifestyle will slow you down. When there's lack and poverty, we cannot accelerate the purposes of God. If there is sickness, then you will not be able to move swiftly. And I want you to begin to look at ways in which we can overcome these. Then there's a very big aspect. It's a very weighty one, which is debt. Debt slows us down drastically. There's many other issues like pride, disobedience to the instructions from God. You, you, you can look at the life of Jonah. He received a mandate but goes in the complete opposite direction and that slowed him down. When you have a hardened heart, you will not come into the purposes of God. Pride, and I'm going to deal with pride today, slows us down. When you as a son of God have the wrong relations or wrong associations like Samson and Solomon, you slow down the purposes of God. And today, I want us to look into the mirror of God's word and discover why we are not coming into this, into this uh, accelerated position. And one of the key areas that I found in the life of many, many believers that is slowing us down is pride. This is not the nature of the Lamb. The lamb displays great humility. In John chapter 13, you can read the narrative. Jesus gave us an example. The disciples had their feet washed by the Lord. And you would know, in him washing their feet, he took off his outer garment and began to do the lowly of tasks. He was derobing and becoming very transparent. This was a picture of humility. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, I feel it's necessary for us to read this into the registry of our teaching this morning. It gives us an in-depth look into the mind of the Lamb of God. Philippians 2.5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, the Lamb, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, the Lamb again, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself, tapanu, and became obedient, obedient even to death, death of the cross. And watch what happens when you have this posture of the Lamb. God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on the earth, and those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. The Lord Jesus postured himself in humility. And this humility is seen in his transparency. Um, you can read John chapter 13 where the Lord Jesus would derobe and come before his disciples and wash their feet. When a person is humble and has this posture of the lamb, they are unpretentious, they are authentic, they are sincere, they display truthfulness, they display agape love. The Bible says love does not seek its own. 
A person of humility is quick to repent. This is something that I believe we must see in our, in our generation that's arising. A generation that is able to display humility will esteem others more highly than themselves. This is what the Bible says in Luke chapter 2. Oh, in Philippians chapter 2, it would say, Let nothing be done through strife, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. When you're a person that's walking in humility, like Christ, you're consistently interceding. Jesus is our intercessor. He lives to make intercession for us. But we as the sons of God, we too can stand in the gap. In 2 Chronicles 7.14, many know the verse, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. And this is something that I, I think many of us, including myself, battle with. This posture of the lamb that is non-retaliatory in nature. Isaiah would capture the nature of the lamb. He would say he was as a sheep before his shearers and he opened not his mouth he was brought as a lamb to the slaughter as a sheep before its shearers is dumb so he opened not his mouth and i know many times we we want to when we've been wronged when we've um, had violations take place against us we want to defend ourselves but the lord jesus christ in the posture of humility knew how to display a non-retaliatory attitude. When, when we walk in humility, and like we've seen throughout the life of Isaac and others like Abraham, you walk in obedience. The opposite of humility is rebellion, which is resisting authority. But when you walk in humility, you are obedient. Jesus would have been obedient on the earth as a man, he would have been obedient to the voice of Joseph. And at times there are Josephs in our lives, there are shepherds in our lives, and the Lord Jesus was obedient on the earth, but he was also obedient to the Father. The Bible will tell us he became obedient unto death. This is the posture of the Lamb. And I think in, in displaying the posture of the Lamb, we must be able to display servanthood. Jesus took on the form of a servant. Philippians 2 and verse number 7. John 13 will tell us how he would wash the feet of the disciples. And in so doing, he said, I leave you an example. An example. When the Lord Jesus came to the Jordan, and a very, very prophetic picture is coming to the Jordan. In Matthew 3, he comes to John at the Jordan. When you read that verse, you'll see it. He comes to a human official at the river Jordan. And John didn't want to baptize the Lord Jesus because he recognized one who had weight. He says, I'm not worthy. I, I lack the weightiness in the spirit. Uh, I cannot even tie your sandal strap. But the Lord Jesus comes to Jordan. And uh, the Jordan is a very strategic location. Jordan means descender. It means to go down or to go low. And many strategic events took place at the Jordan. At the Jordan, the Lord Jesus Christ was baptized. And the heavens opened at the river Jordan. And the Father declares, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now, when you read Luke chapter 3, the Bible will tell us in verse 3, And he went into all the region around the Jordan, this is John, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. You see, John preached baptism and repentance in the region of the Jordan. And in order for us to enter into the kingdom, into promises, there has to be a repentant heart, a penitent attitude. One who walks in the posture of the Lamb walks with a penitent attitude. That means you are consistently adjusting your posture, looking at where you have gone astray and bringing yourself into alignment 
with divine purpose, with the word of God, the command, statutes. At the river Jordan, the father announces that this is his son. When we position ourselves in humility and we descend, the father announces our sonship on the earth. Now, very key for us is that at the Jordan, there was clear definition given to the laws. You read in Deuteronomy 1, on this side of the Jordan, Moses began to explain the law, Deuteronomy 1.5. And the Jordan was the place where definition and clarity to the laws were given. And we today must be dipped into the Jordan, which is a picture of the word of God that brings definition and understanding to God's word and his demands. Understanding will lead to obedience. It is at the river Jordan in 2 Kings chapter 2 that mantles are exchanged. Elisha receives a double portion at the river Jordan. And I believe it is key for the next generation to walk in humility for mantles to be exchanged. We live in a society that believes everything must happen quick and speedily. Um, there's no waiting. There's no serving. It took Elisha a long time to receive a mantle. And I believe today that Jordan is a place where the mantle is received and is tested. Elisha was a spiritual son to Elijah. And he picked up his father's mantle at the Jordan. See, when a son is able to humble himself and walk with his father, not for one or two or ten years, but probably in Elisha's case for at least 20 years, you come to the place of the Jordan. And this mantle is a mantle that is loaded with grace. Many leaders, church leaders, are concerned about the next generation. We live in a generation today and amongst a young society that lives with a sense of entitlement that they are entitled to a lot of stuff they're not willing to walk with the grace of a father when you walk in pride you walk with personal ambition when you're walking in pride you are reliant on yourself you have an inflated self-esteem you have delusions of grandeur and for the Son of God, for the Son of God to arise on the earth again and for purpose to be accelerated, we must overcome pride. The Lord Jesus is our pattern. He is our example. And he overcame pride. How did he overcome pride? The first thing that we have to do is you have to overcome personal ambition. Jesus remained on the cross. In Matthew 27 and verse 40, it says, um, it, it declares, and saying, Thou that destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Jesus remained on the cross. He submitted to the will of the Father. He said, Father, if it's possible, remove this cup. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And I want to say to us today that when we chose to follow Christ, we have to take up our cross. And taking up your cross means giving yourself a death sentence. This faith is a faith of self-denial. We have to sacrifice personal ambition for the sake of the kingdom. If you have personal ambition, Many times you will want to use God to attain your ambition. But if you are truly a son of God and have an authentic salvation, you will lay down your will for the Father's will. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth personal ambition, even when it comes to finances. Many times, and over the last year, we found that many people began to repent because we were reliant on ourselves. 
Jesus acknowledged his complete dependence on the Father. The nation going through the wilderness had to be completely reliant on the Father. He takes them through the wilderness, squeezes them, humbles them, so that they are reliant on him for bread, uh, they are reliant on him for water, they are reliant on him for their health. And this is a time in history when we are seeing the same thing take place, where we are completely reliant on him. Jesus said to them, I say to you in John 5, 19, the son can do nothing of himself. And this is why Psalmist David would write, not unto us, not unto us, but to your name be glory. The world seeks its fame, it seeks its, its, uh, its um, uh, self-glory. But when we are in the posture of son, we declare the son can do nothing of himself. And I pray today that you would adopt this posture. You would not seek to bring any attention to yourself. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Jesus had to go through the process of emptying himself. Emptying himself of his position, emptying himself of his glory. And the word that we can use is he had to divest himself. Moses, at the age of 40, was the prince of Egypt and was the Hebrew of Hebrews. But God took him through the backside of a desert, brought him to the Mount of God, which is the Mount of Horeb, which means to be uh, in a place of uh, uh, dryness, a place of non-productivity. And for 40 years, another 40 years, Moses went through the kenosis process of emptying out himself before he could be commander in chief. And when Moses began to speak, you know, he went up to the mountain and when he came back, the people would, would be uh, walking and dancing around the calf. When Moses began to speak, he spoke with the authority of heaven. How can we speak with the authority of heaven? How can we speak into environments where we conform them and bring them into divine alignment? It is only when we have emptied ourselves of ourselves. There was a man in the Bible, his name was Naaman. And I think it's a good case study during your devotional time. Please read 2 Kings chapter 5. The Bible says in 2 Kings 5, Naaman, now Naaman was the commander of the army of the king of Syria. He was great and honorable in the eyes of his master because by him, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Naaman was this great Syrian army leader, but he was a leper. And the Bible will tell us, when the Syrian had gone out on raids, he had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus the girl who is from the land of Israel has said. Then the king of Israel said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. Notice, Naaman externally had all the trimmings and trappings of greatness. He was a leader and a commander in the Syrian army. But he had leprosy. And leprosy throughout the scriptures is a picture of pride. And God was not just dealing with the external leprosy of Naaman. He was dealing with the internal posture of his heart. So Naaman would get to Elisha. And when he got to e Elisha, the Bible says in verse 9, Naaman went with his horses and his chariots, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger or his servant to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan. Go and descend, Naaman, you great Syrian army leader. Go to the descender and go and dip seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. But watch what Naaman says in verse 11. But Naaman became furious, went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me. That is the, that is the, 
highlighting posture of pride, me, myself, and I. And stand and call on the name of the Lord. Wave his hand over the place and heal my leprosy. And this is what Naaman says. He says, are not the Abana and the Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? You see, Naaman was wanting attention. He was wanting Elisha to come out to him. But Elisha, as the servant of the Lord, had already released the word. All Naaman needed to do was posture himself in the river Jordan. And the rivers of Damascus were more beautiful. In fact, if you study the Farpa and the Abana, these are rivers that are, are, are literally meanings beauty and fertility. In fact, Abana in modern times is called a golden stream. So Naaman felt that it would be better for him to go to the golden stream the place of beauty and fertility rather than dip himself in the river Jordan which was seen as one that depicted lowliness, humility and at times even dirt. What God was wanting to do was he was wanting to deal with the internal posture of Naaman's heart and I can tell you today the Lord is dealing in the last 12 months with a lot of internal constructs of our hearts and his servants came to Naaman and spoke to him and said my father if the prophet told you to do something great would you not have done it how much more than when he says to you wash and be clean so he went watch what he did so he went down so he went down and this is very key and he dipped seven times in the Jordan and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child and he was clean. You have to go to Jordan. You have to come into, you have to come down. And many people today have not been able to access grace because of this posture of pride. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world was a lamb who displayed humility to us. If we want to set ourselves on a pathway of great acceleration in this season, then we have to be postured in humility. Naaman had to go to the Jordan and dip seven times. The number seven depicts rest and perfection. In order to come to rest and perfection, you have to be willing to take instructions from a servant. You will notice Naaman first took instructions from the servant girl in his house. Then he took instruction from the servant of Elisha. And then he takes instructions from his own servants. And this is bringing him into the posture of a servant. If you want to access grace, and grace is simply divine enablement, you have to posture yourselves in humility. Jehu knew how to posture himself in humility, and he was able to bring down Jezebel. Barnabas, who was a Levite, humbled himself, and he was able to access apostolic grace. In our walk with the Lord, we must walk in humility, not walking in this sense of entitlement. You have to overcome an inflated self-esteem. That's what Naaman's greatest vice was. It was his ego and his self-esteem. Jesus would walk with sinners. He would walk with publicans. And he was able to showcase that he is one who didn't have an inflated self-esteem. Paul on the road to Damascus had to fall off the horse. He had to uh, go to the street called straight. We must today overcome a mental condition that is gripping South Africa and the nations, which is delusions of grandeur. Paul was one of the greatest scholars of his day, but when he had come into the church he submitted um, at Jerusalem and he also submitted to the church at Antioch when we walk in the posture of the lamb we submit ourselves to civil authority we submit ourselves 
to our local church, to the leader of our local church. The Bible would say in Ephesians 5, 21, Submit yourselves one to another. Wives, walk in submission to husbands. Submission is not suppression or oppression. The word sub submission simply in the original means to live under divine design. And finally, we can live free of entitlement. You have to overcome entitlement. I want to address all our children today and say to us today that we are entitled to nothing. Everything is given to us, even by our parents at times, by the grace of God. We have to know how to overcome entitlement. We have to know today that we are saved by grace. We have to know that every gift comes from God. Know that all that you are and all that you have are a result of of God's goodness and God's blessings. 1 Corinthians 4, 7 says, For who maketh thee to differ from one another? And what is thou that thou did not receive? Now if you did receive it, why did thou glory as if thou had been given it? Everything comes from the Lord. This posture of humility will see grace being downloaded in our lives. Here's a quick humility test. We've done this before. But are you a person who is concerned about your name or your title? When you mess up in your marriage, when you mess up in your home, children, when you make mistakes in the office or at school, are you quick to say, I'm sorry and seek forgiveness? The prodigal son in Luke 15 had to come to a pigsty before he came to his senses. Are you one who is able to receive correction, rebuke, instruction? Nathan had to rebuke David. Do you as a person know how to say thank you? Only one leper came back of the 10. That's a 10% thank you rate. Are you able as a person to receive gifts? Do you know how to say thank you? Are you one who gets very angry if you are ignored, if you are not given the front line, the stage light, the limelight, notice Moses was formed at the back end of the desert, not the front side. Do you feel it belittling to have someone who is less qualified instruct you? Can, you? can you have fellowship with poor people or people who are not in your economic class? Can you go to their homes, dine at their tables? Do you look down on other race groups and even look up to other race groups? Do you feel it um, upsetting to, to, to ride in a taxi? These are all things that we have to ask ourselves. And as the Son of God who came in the posture of the Lamb, Jesus showed us that he was able to meander between levels. He could go into the temple, he could engage in dialogue with the Pharisees, he could sit with sinners and publicans, he could sit with children, he could go and eat the best meal, he could ride on a donkey and a colt, he could sit in a boat. He was one who was not afraid to do the lowliest of tasks. And today, God has lifted him up. He has raised him to the summit. And many people desire to come to the summit of opulence. But their posture is not right. I pray today that you as a son of God will get your posture right. As we conclude this morning's journey, I want to speak to you about Shrek the sheep. Yep, we got it right. Shrek the sheep. Uh, Shrek was a sheep from New Zealand who uh, shot to fame in around the year 2004. This was due to his gigantic coat of fleece. And I think we're going to try and show you a picture of Shrek right now. Shrek became famous after he escaped from his enclosure. And for several years, Shrek evaded his shearers by hiding in caves for I think up to seven years and merino sheep are actually sheared annually but Shrek evaded the blade for more than six years and when he was finally caught in the caves 
Shrek as a sheep was unrecognizable. Someone commented that Shrek looked like a biblical character. But sh sheep are meant to shred their wool every year. And during his cave living days, Shrek grew a fleece weighing 27 kilograms. That's roughly six times the average fleece produced by merino sheep. His fleece contained enough wool to make more than 20 suits for men. And I want to say to us today that when Shrek was found, he needed a shepherd who could shear him. And the wool would be used to make coverings for others. You see, when you live uh, for yourself and you evade the blade of the shepherd or the shearer, you carry weight that causes you to slow down. At the center of pride, even if you spell it, is I. But when you live for the benefit of others, you keep growing and you keep giving. It's selfless, it's sacrificial, but it's for the benefit of another. And I pray today that as you posture yourself in the nature of the Lamb, come under the blade of a shepherd, you will become valuable, you will be of value, and more than anything else, your joy will come when you see others being blessed by your will. May the grace of God sustain you and keep you during these perilous times. Grace and peace to all.